is also responsible for the creative design and content of Aulani, a Disney resort and spa at Ko'olina, Oahu, Hawaii. He continues today to oversee new attractions for Animal Kingdom, including an upcoming land-based uh, exhibition based uh, on James Cameron's avatar. The challenge of creating Disney's Animal Kingdom, a park with a strong wildlife conservation image and message, evolved, involved years of research and negotiation with constituents from the scientific community, the world of zoos, and representatives of indigenous communities involved in the stories created in the park. In the process of developing the park itself, Joe was instrumental in the development of the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund, which has allocated over $20 million to projects around the world. Joe speaks regularly on design and narrative and has spoken at NASA, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, the TED Conference, Portland Creative Conference, and Bin has been the keynote speaker at SIGGRAPH in Boston and Yokohama, as well as many other venues. Joe is a graduate of Occidental College in Los Angeles and lives in Altadena, California, with his wife and two boys. His personal adventures have taken him to many of the most remote corners of the world. He wears a large collection of earrings from these adventures in his left ear, which has become very large indeed. So friends, Joe Rodi. Ah. Okay, so I will attempt to make my remarks pertinent for the morning, and, and I'm going to talk uh, mainly about the use of narrative as a tool, uh, both in structuring places that people come and visit and move through, and uh, the organization of teams to get those places done, to get them opened. Um, I'm interested, and I have been interested for quite some time, in the mechanics of creativity uh, and in the mechanics of narrative. Uh, we work in a business, I work in a business, that um, it's, it's easy to simply drift into kind of a subjective attitude about everything. I like this, you like that, people like this. Um, and yet we're given huge sums of money to do the projects that we do, and it seems to me that those projects should be done with something more uh, than just a subjective attitude about what is or isn't good. For, so for quite some time, I've been very interested in studying uh, both the psychology and to the extent that I can comprehend it, the neurology of our reaction to the arts, of our reaction to narrative, and how that impinges uh, upon our design. A lot of people who write about creativity and its relationship to the brain um, are neither a, a, a brain scientist, you know, and Nancy's quite an exception. Very often these books are written by a reporter who's, who's investigating and who writes sort of from an objective third person. I, I am an artist. Uh, I do these things. Nancy, of course, is a brain researcher. So between the two of us, uh, we sort of have a nice bookend about this notion of creativity and the arts. I'm very applied, um, I work every day. Um, if you consider uh, Nancy's keynote as being about the interior mechanisms of the human brain and how that relates to creativity, my focus is really creativity in groups. How you take the individuals who may be creative and aggregate them in such a way that that creativity can now be manifested in another kind of brain. Uh, and that brain is an extended brain formed of the group. But as a metaphor, it, it's not um, inaccurate. You have to kind of replicate the kind of free association that happens inside of a brain, inside of a group. Putting a bunch of creative people together does not necessarily accomplish anything. And indeed, across the course of human history, creative people have been gathered together simply so you could line them up and shoot them. There's nothing about a group of creative people getting together that necessarily says the next thing that's going to happen is some big creative thing. So you have to focus on making it happen. Now I came to this somewhat uh, through serendipity. Long time ago I was asked to take on the job of, of conceptualizing this place, uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom. It's a really unusual challenge because 
at the time we started this work, there was no paradigm whatsoever for how such a thing could come to be. The established wisdom about what the business was had nothing to do uh, with what, what this thing would have to be. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Animal Kingdom, it's a very large, uh, for lack of a better term to describe it, a very large theme park. It treats with issues about wildlife conservation. It presents animals in very large natural habitats in which those animals effectively live, for the most part, a wild life, uh, but they are managed populations. People come to this place. They have a series of adventures. These adventures are structured, uh, but the covert goal of everything within the park is to encourage involvement in wildlife conservation, and indeed the park does directly solicit uh, people to become involved in funding and participating uh, in wildlife conservation. But it in no way resembles what the business was prior to our beginning this project. Uh, it involves these wide open spaces that are uh, to all um, effect not designed at all. Um, it participates in a kind of visual reality that is quite scrupulously observed, very heavily researched, um, and needs to be as accurate as we can responsibly make it, rather than some kind of colonialist fantasy. Um, it is an educational facility with the overt goal of raising people's consciousness and informing them about issues. None of these are what people say in their mind they want when they go on vacation. Um, and it is a political action mechanism that distributes funds both through the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund and through the actions of our own extensive staff of research scientists who work around the world in all kinds of projects associated with wildlife conservation. None of this is possible uh, without addressing the basic core narratives, the basic core paradigms of what this business thought it was before we began. And in the process of going through all that, uh, some things became clear to me. I became super interested in how, how this worked. And I've sort of developed a mode of working uh, that is based on some of what I'm going to talk about today. So it's predicated on a few things that I would hold to be true. And I think that um, the various studies that are out there today tend to reinforce. We're living in a very peculiar time. Um, um, I do believe we're living through a kind of Copernican revolution in our understanding of ourselves as a human creature. Um, and the impact of this Copernican revolution will be as great uh, in our own understanding of ourselves as the Copernican revolution was in our understanding of the planetary systems that surround us. And it will be as filled with friction because there are um, bodies of thought with a deep vested interest in inductive assumptions about the human state that are going to come up in conflict with deductive uh, revelations about the human state as we go through this. Uh, and not all of that is just a conflict between science and religion. There's, there's the humanities, uh, there's philosophy. Um, I mean, what is the meaning of John Locke and his philosophy about human beings once it comes up against real statistical evidence um, and, and research evidence about the real way a human brain really reacts uh, to societal impact. So it's quite an interesting time to be working. So in all of that, I have a little thread of work that interests me. Um, and it more or less revolves around the functions of narrative in the human creature and how that works for us. Narrative is at the root of our divergence from other primates in the course of our ev evolution. There is a very, um, very good book I'll talk about in a second, uh, Derek Bickerton, uh, Adam's Tongue, uh, which describes the moment of divergence uh, between us and our other ancestors and how uh, language um, plays a role in, in this point or how the evolution of language plays, plays a role in this point. But you can bank on the fact that, lang uh, that narrative is deeply embedded uh, in our human state, that we, we talk our way through the existence that we have. The, the events that are actually happening to us are separated from the narrative we tell ourselves by fragments of time that are measurable. Uh, so that indeed what you perceive of happening here as I stand here and talk is a narrative that you're already constructing uh, in your brain out of all kinds of fragmented information, putting together, telling to yourself, and almost the moment you, telling, you tell it to yourself, committing to as a kind of a foundation for further narrative that you're going to tell in the future. 
Um, in Bickerton's book, he talks about this moment in the evolutionary history of human creatures when um, we could no longer forage for large dead prehistoric animals whose bone marrow was contained for months and months and months inside their long bones like packaged food because that niche is saturated and full. And the next niche that's open is to go find small animals. Small animals don't last that long and they get eaten up really fast by other animals. So now suddenly, not suddenly of course, over the course of who knows how much time, you have to send out scouts who leave the group, go off, look for food, find food, come back to the group, and what can they possibly do? Without symbolic language, without displacement, without recruitment, without the capacity to communicate somehow to a bunch of primates who are sitting there with tiny little foreheads and a pretty dull look on their face, well, you do what? To try to convince them that over two hills and on the other side of the river is a dead zebra that just got killed, and if we don't go over there right now and scare away two hyenas, there's gonna be 40 hyenas and we're not gonna eat. So we need to get up now, go over two hills across the river to where the dead zebra is so we could get food. How can you do this? Um, without symbolic communication. So somewhere in this point, we, we, we become two things, very social. We suddenly need to enlist a whole bunch of people in helping us, because it's not like all 40 of us stumbled across a dead mammoth. One guy found a zebra a mile and a half away. So the only way we're gonna eat is by being social, by communicating with each other, by sharing information, and we need the means to do that. And the second interesting thing is this is not just verbal. This form of communication is physical. It's body posture, it's movement, it's facial attitude. It's not just words. That's important to me because I don't design verbal communication. I design places. So that's interesting. And that's deep in the bones of how we, how we form thoughts and how we communicate thoughts. There is, of course, in postmodern thought, this whole attitude that all of narrative is socially constructed that the only thing we are is a social construction. And therefore, if we could simply reconstruct the narrative, we could reconstruct the society underneath it. That's just probably not true. Um, we are human creatures. We are here. We couldn't possibly exist unless there were the same forces causing us to exist that have caused everything else to exist. That's a game worth playing. Um, so on the one hand, you have the truth. There is societally constructed narrative, plot, plot structure, certain elements of character, and there is a kind of primal narrative that pre-exists any of that that is deep in our bones. Things that have survival value tend to be oversupplied. In order to be there when you need them, they are also there when you don't need them. So narrative is a little bit like that. We are compulsive narrators, compulsive story formers as a creature. We can't help but start to make sense narrative sense, connective meaning out of the things that we see. As Nancy was saying yesterday, we do this when we're not thinking about anything. We start associating things with each other. So here we have on the screen behind me three images, three interesting, bewitching, symbolic images, which were acquired by typing the word random into my computer, going to the bottom right corner of the page, selecting the image, scrolling up till I had a new set of images, selecting the image at the bottom right corner, doing that three times and putting them on the screen. And yet, in the time that those images have been on the screen, I'll bet you at least half the people in the room are trying to figure out what it means and beginning to convince themselves that it does mean something, when in fact it could not be a more perfect rendering of utter randomness. Really, really interesting. Um, metaphor is the same way. Metaphor. Uh, the, the correlation, strange correlation between things. It's pretty peculiar that a group of, oop, where did that go? There it is, metaphor. So we can look at this image. What, is, what, do we, what, do, what do we have? We have some hands, a piano, a piece of metal that is utterly without any clear representative meaning, and some fire, and yet, and yet, it's impossible for us not to associate these things with each other through their shared capacity of wingy bird-likeness, which is not a logical f uh, part of any of them. This capacity to form metaphor is super deep in our consciousness um, and probably has something to do with the fact that our brain really processes things in little, little bits, right? There's a part of your brain that registers verticality, another part that recognizes faces, another part that recognizes sequence, another area that picks up color. So in fact, 
colorness, verticalness, movingness, spaciness. Those are all separate things anyway. Um, and, and so your brain is predisposed to sort of connect things up in this rather poetic way. There's plenty on this uh, in this great book by Brian Boyd, um, The Origin of Stories, more than I can go into now. But my point is basically you can bank on narrative and you can bank on fictional narrative. You can bank on stories that are made up. There is almost greater survival value in fiction than there is in logic, in history, in data. Data is very good at describing what has already happened. Lots of animals have really, really elaborate data banks uh, that inform their behavior, but very few animals can speculate on something that has never happened. And yet, things happen all the time that have never happened before. So surely, we are descended from primates who speculated, hmm, I wonder if we should move out of this valley. I was kind of freaked out by that story about the big wave. That, you know, so I'm moving, and you know, 250 years later, there's a big wave, and everybody else in the valley is gone. So we are those people. We are not existentialists. We are not alone. We are unified by some kind of core sense of narrative that holds us all together. I design for groups. I don't design for individuals. I design for groups, big groups. And you have to have some faith that there's some unifying factors in these groups that people can um, respond to. So we lead with primal emotion, we lead with sensation, we follow with information. Um, emotion exists to signify to you that things are important. So if you can stimulate emotion first, you're going you're gonna to follow with this assumption, oh, I'm feeling this, this must be significant, this must be important, and therefore you can follow with information. Um, and you can pretty well bank on some of these human universals. A lot of you have probably seen this diagram before. I don't know how many people have. Um, but I think it's a pretty interesting illustration. One of these forms is called Maloma. One of them is called Taketa, uh, Buba, Kiki. There's all these different names. What's interesting is when you ask people, and I'm going to ask you, which one of these is Maloma? Yeah, so that's right. Like, everybody on the planet says that. Everybody on the planet says that's Maloma. Now, I just want you to consider how many things that means. Because, first of all, Maloma doesn't mean a thing. Maloma is not a word. It's just a bunch of sounds. That is not a thing either. That is a two-dimensional, linear, there's no form, there's no color in the form. It's a line on a flat surface. So somehow in your brain, a line on a flat surface is translated into a representation of a form that is dimensional. That form that is dimensional has a tactile quality. That tactile quality is soft. The softness of that tactile quality somehow relates to an auditory quality that is captured in the word maloma, which also is tactile because of the way your lips compress and form when you say the word maloma. And that all somehow makes sense to people all around the world. That's pretty weird. Um, so you can bank on that kind of stuff and form these very, very primal associations and pretty much have a sense of confidence that they're going to be effective. Now, placemaking, what I do, is storytelling in space where the body, the human body, is inside the story. It's not on the page of a book. It's not on the screen. You're inside that story. So the spatio-tactile uh, aspect of storytelling is very important to us. We are compulsive pattern makers. Um, Again, go back to the origins. We formed our capacity to tell ourselves stories while moving through space. I happen to personally believe that one of the reasons so many of our words for abstract thought are spatial is because abstract thought itself was formed as our ancestors migrated through space. The future really is in front of you. Um, um, you know, uh, I won't go into another whole lecture about that, but anyway. So pattern investment, pattern recognition is a big piece of what makes us uh, um, able to form these stories. We love patterns. We're deeply invested in them once we find them. Um, and this is one of the reasons. There are four deadly animals uh, in these images. Um, and they are really, really hard to see. That's bad. So you can imagine standing on the edge of the savanna all those hundreds of thousands of years ago with your buddy and looking out across the savanna and one guy saying, oh my God, oh my God, there's like 45, 50 leopards out there. And the other guy saying, that 
is an ecological impossibility. There cannot be 40 leopards out there. I'm going to go check. We are only descended from one of those two people. And it is not the guy who goes to check. It's the other guy who sees like 40 leopards. Because if you see 40 leopards, you will see one. So there's a lion there. No, there's a lion there. There's a Gabon viper here, which is a very deadly African snake. There's a leopard in there peeking out at you through the grasses. And there's a leopard in there peeking out at you from the grasses. Leopards, last man standing in the world of big cats because you can't find them. Um, but once you find them, I dare you to try to unfind them. You will not be able to unsee that lion once you see it. That is why we are so invested in the patterns that we do form. And there's tons of this in a great book, uh, The Art Instinct by Dennis Dutton, which I won't go into now, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you can bank on the fact that we are going to set and find patterns and invest in them when we find them. Now, narrative is a kind of big pattern. And as patterns go, I submit that narrative is a kind of fractal pattern. Um, when I talk about narrative, I'm not talking about plot structure. I'm not talking about linear plot, because linear plot is, in fact, one of the societally constructed narrative forms. I'm talking about the associative linking of things with each other in this harmonic way that makes you just know that they are all related to each other. They all hang together and make sense. That is self-similarity. That is recursiveness. That is like a fractal pattern. Now, here's two fractal patterns. One of them is a mathematical fractal generated by a computer. The other is a natural fractal that is similar. The mathematical fractal, of course, anyone who knows anything about fractals will know that if I zoom in on a single frond of a frond of that fractal, it's going to look just like the entire fractal. And it will infinitely, infinitely repeat this uh, form as long as I want to look, which will turn out to be not very long. Uh, because, of course, the other thing our brain wants to do is pattern, 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 got it, good, lock it, file it, let's move on. The other fractal, the actual fern, is attempting to generate something similar, but in a world of frost and bugs and boots tromping on it and winter and summer and someone who comes along and snips it off so they can take a photograph of it. Um, and so that is an imperfect pattern. And in the imperfect pattern, quality of that pattern is our continual attention. We have to continue to pay attention because we know there's a pattern, but it is not reconciling itself. It continues to re-express and then vary and re-express and then vary, and that makes us want to look. Um, and this is what one is trying to do when one uses uh, this theory to try to make, make narrative. This does work in literature if you think of Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens wrote like millions and millions of words, and you know, a stack of Dickens books side by side is more than my arms can stretch out and encompass. And yet, if you've ever read any Charles Dickens, the next Charles Dickens you read, you will go, oh, that is so Charles Dickens. Well, that is recursive and self-similar. And what makes it Charles Dickens is the fact that he habitually embeds fractal patterns inside his own writing. Uh, so this is just a single paragraph um, I think it's from, not hard times, it's Mr. Gradgrind's classroom. And inside of the paragraph describing the other thing is another set of correlations, squareness, bareness, hardness, you know, square, 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 warehouse, stubborn, that itself is a kind of fractal. So these things are folded inside and inside and inside and inside each other. So if narrative is a kind of fractal pattern, fractals are dependent on something called a strange attractor, which is the formulaic element inside the fractal mathematics that causes it to generate a form that is recursive and self-similar. So what, then, is the strange attractor inside a narrative pattern? I believe it is the theme. Typically, we are taught in school to derive theme from literature. We look at a piece of completed literature, analyze it, and derive themes from it. But in the construction of narrative places, what one does is place the theme at the beginning of the work and base all subsequent work on it. Um, so theme stands in relationship to uh, printed literature almost the way the psychological concept of schema does uh, to the building of place. Schema are foundational assumptions that we all hold. Many of them are prejudices. But we are deeply invested in them. They are very, very difficult for us to trade out. 
and all kinds of subsequent assumptions are piled on top of them. A uh, schema de leads directly to the problem of confirmation bias. Once we come to know and understand something, we tend to know and understand everything else that we learn and see in terms of the thing we already know and understand, um, so that we are just fantastically illogical creatures who are really easy to be led off to um, all kinds of strange places. But that could be useful um, if you're trying to advance the cause of wildlife conservation. Now, just to be clear on how theme functions, just a little illustration, this is um, a concept, the West. Now, just those words, just those words could mean anything to a room full of people like this here in the Philippines, anything at all. It could mean the entire West and its history. It could mean the American West. It could mean West of here which would be China. It could mean a million things, right? We don't know what that means. It has no meaning. It is a setting. It is not a theme at all. As soon as I start applying settings to it, by the way, when I did this, I assumed it was the American West. Um, innocence versus corruption, the glory of nature, greed destroys all, those are themes. And the themes begin to color the potential interpretation of the setting so that it is more deterministic. You've narrowed the field from 360 degrees to, say, 45 degrees of possibility. So theme is the coordinating function that adds focus uh, to these settings. Now, to a lone writer, this stuff is all implicit. A, a single writer writing alone in a room does not need to verbalize these things, does not need to say them outside of their own head, because their own head is the working system in which this is all being done. But in a large group of coordinated people, you need to say these things out loud. And you need to make sure that people hear them, that they can repeat them back, and that they can repeat back the founding diagram that leads to all further work. That's what helps the group start to function like a brain. So I'm going to just use my own project, not because I'm promoting projects, but just because I have slides. Um, and I can vouch for the veracity of what I'm going to claim. Um, so I'll just show you how this worked for us when we were uh, in the process of developing Disney's Animal Kingdom. Um, we're trying to use this theme to stimulate some kind of divergent proposal to do something that had never been done before, and we're fighting a huge uphill battle against a vast constellation of confirmation bias. So at the time that I received this mission, which was like four words, park based on animals, I don't know what that is, five words, um, the business is very well established. Everybody knows what the business is. The business makes money. The business has recognizable, iconic design elements that everybody knows. The business has an established fund of intellectual property that everyone can draw from. The business has resulted in the advancement and promotion of hundreds of people who hold places within the company of power and influence, all based on what the business is, and the business is this. And this is a world that is idealized, that is purified, that is stripped of negativity, stripped of contradiction, a world that is bermed off from the outside world by a magic wall, a world in which we know all the stories, uh, we know how those stories end, we know all the characters in the stories, and we know where the stories came from, which is a beloved author who has assured us of all the resolution and all the control and all the guarantee that is implicit in this image. That is the business. Animals don't do like that. They live and die in time. They are attached to political, socioeconomic realities that cannot be denied. They are free to do whatever they want and will not cooperate with some art directy sense of trying to control their behavior, and to do so would be immoral. They have flies. They conduct bodily functions right in front of you. None of this stuff works with that image that was up there before. None of this stuff correlates. So there is no way to reconcile what the business is with what the mission is, which is to take that business and do something with animals without stripping the business back to its utter core and rebuilding a new set of paradigms around the essential nature of animals themselves, which nobody had done. Um, you can't change the subject because it's unchangeable. 
It is its own nature. So you have to rebuild the paradigm based on the subject itself. And this led us, after a bit of work, to a set of values that expressed the values implicit in animals. And those values, there are several, but there's three that are worth talking about. One is the intrinsic value of nature itself, the notion that nature is a value against which or above which no other value could be supreme, that nature's value is immutable, untradeable, and permanent because the animals are only going to behave in a natural fashion, so you can't possibly put some other value between you and them. Uh, the second was this notion of adventure as a, a developmental, not just physical, but developmental, that you should go places where you don't know what's going to happen. You should experience the unknown. You should see what you have not seen, do what you have not done, experience what you have not seen, because this will make you better and you will grow, because we don't know what these animals are going to do, so we can't guarantee you what they're going to do. So we have to create a place that is predicated on the idea that we don't know what's going to happen. And the third was this personal call to action, that the story would be about you and the choices you are going to make. And we built our whole place around these premises. Now, I'm just going to run you through an exercise. Some of you might have been there yesterday when I did this, so don't cheat. Um, but um, just so you can see how this works, because it's very interesting. Um, so if I start with the premise that I'm going to make a place that is about the intrinsic value of nature, would that place poetically be more about architecture or more about landscape? Yes, I've asked this question all over the world. Rooms full of 5,000 people, nobody says architecture. So don't worry if you, you know, it, they all say landscape. Everybody says landscape. So the moment they say landscape, this sets up a, a, a geometry, a link between the presumption of intrin intrinsic nature and the expression in, in, in landscape. Now, this is an element of landscape, so clearly the job's not finished yet. We spend a lot of time sort of re thinking, thinking this through. What kind of landscape uh, expresses the intrinsic value of nature? Because clearly it's not uh, every form of landscape. And we propose to ourselves, again, a set of questions. So if I'm dealing with the intrinsic value of nature and my form is landscape, is that landscape going to be formal or informal? That's also correct according to the rest of all humankind. Um, so, so really what you're kind of doing here is starting to form what I think really are neural connections of association. Interestingly, as Nancy said, our brain is associating all the time. So once you get a team of people following this thought geometry, it's burned in and it's happening when they don't think it's happening. So they start to see it wherever they look. And it, it works pretty extraordinarily well. Um, so we end up with a kind of a canon, a design canon, which everybody who's working on the project can buy into and which lends the project extraordinary uh, consistency of expression. Uh, it makes it very highly correlated, very highly associated with itself. Uh, uh, the metaphor of what it is about is expressed over and over again in every possible form, which makes it sort of a heightened state of um, the aha uh -huh kind of response, right? Normally, when we're walking out in the world, our brain has to work really hard to find patterns, to reconcile them, and figure out their meaning. But in a place where all the patterns are pre-loaded and pre-reconciled, your brain is seeing way, way, way more patterns than it would normally see at a faster rate than it would normally see them in the real world, and it feels that. And so it's like, oh, I'm so proud of myself. I found more patterns. It feels really good. People talk about people feeling really good when they walk inside one of these places. I really think this is what is going on. Um, you also have to do the counter-programming for the architecture, so you need an answer as to, since there will be architecture, how do you handle architecture? We solve that by saying that architecture within Animal Kingdom would be either subject to the forces of nature or would be celebratory of nature itself. I promise you, you can drive this down to really, really tiny scales of expression. I did this yesterday in another group, and I'll do it for you. But just bear with me. How many of you people have ever seen Disney's Animal Kingdom? Okay, so you people don't answer because you know all these questions. Everybody else. 
Just imagine it's 600 acres of land, which is like the size of Venice, Italy. 600 acres. There's a door. Is the door in a place about the intrinsic value of nature, is that door wood or stainless steel? If there's a wooden door about the intrinsic value of nature, is that wood smooth or rough? If there's a doorknob the size of my fist on a door in 600 acres the size of Venice, Italy, is it stainless steel or bronze? Because bronze will show signs of wear and patina. If there's a pattern the size of my thumbnail on the doorknob, the size of my thumbnail must be one ten millionth of the surface area of this entire place, is it geometric or is it organic? Now, by the time you've completed that kind of diagrammatic linking, that kind of association of thought, you could turn loose this room full of people who don't know me, have never been to Animal Kingdom before, and ask them to submit ideas to be in that park. And the incidence of propriety, the statistical incidence of those ideas being valid, would be way higher than random. Way higher than random. That's how this works. Once the associations start, they run, and they run, and they run, and they run, because you've already burned enough pathways for everything to run through. If I had a script in this place, would it, be, would it be an improvisational script or a literal script? Improvisational, on and on and on and on. Is this a place where you expect to see primary colors or earth tones? And forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. So it's pretty interesting as a way to, to lay down um, a set of assumptions that then make everything rhyme with each other. Um, you're basically creating associative links that once you've created them, they run on their own when you're having breakfast. Um, and it causes the place to rhyme with itself in a really interesting way, so that um, everything seems to correlate. Now, we're putting your human body inside here, and we're preparing you for these moments that we cannot control, moments when an animal might stop a vehicle, um, you know, moments that could be moments of danger that in a place that had proposed, perfection and control, these would be mistakes. But in a place that proposes nature and adventure, these are the ultimate expression of what the place is about. They also allow us, and this is important for museums, to load the experience with very high positive emotional states. These positive emotional states are coming, A, from moments of high excitement, and B, from this extraordinary state of correlation. So once you have a powerful emotional state, since emotion exists to signify that what is happening is important and worth paying attention to, you can now get people to pay attention to something. You cannot get them to pay attention by coming at it the other way. Nobody wants to listen. They want to listen because they're already excited, they're already emotionally engaged. Now they will listen. Uh, and so we use this. We also use it as a design guide to create a place that does not look like it's a fantasy so that even though it's a fiction, <coughs> it's a realistic fiction. It is not fantasy fiction, it is documentary fiction. Um, so you feel like the world that you're in is consistent with the stories that you're telling, and therefore the actions that you take in this world have a kind of validity like, like the actions you might take in the outside world. So the objects are not held together by their logical association with each other. They're held together by their common association with central ideas that are expressed through all of them, basically through metaphor. Now this works for the product, but it also works for the people. Human beings are narrative creatures. They just are, they're narrative creatures. So therefore, if I was to collect together a group of narrative creatures and try to get them to cooperate with each other, the best tool I have to do that with is narrative itself. So what we try to do is impose a kind of structure that is sideways and separate from the hierarchical structure of the organization. Hierarchy is a kind of um, logical way of organizing human effort so that things can get done by having a small number of decision makers and a large number of people uh, doing work. But it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with motive. So what we do, is we try to lay out that idea very, very clearly in a diagram like this. Now, yesterday when 
uh, Nancy was talking about uh, free asso uh, the, the associative function of the brain. She mentioned this idea that there's no executive function going on. The association is self-organizing. That's precisely what I'm talking about here. In the center of this organization is nobody, only the set of ideas. So the highest, most empowered executive person or function associated with could be distributed anywhere on this axis from advocacy to dissent with very little guarantee. So when you take this um, diagram, think of it like a charismatic diagram of enthusiasm for the premise of intrinsic value of nature, and you impose that inside of a pyramidical hierarchy, you have no idea how it's distributed. The president of the company there, and the head of maintenance might be there, uh, and the chief engineer might be here. So what you've done is virally spread enthusiasm and dissent uh, through the organization. Now the second thing that's important about this is maintaining communication uh, from dissent to advocacy. So you're constantly trying to make sure that you are spreading the geometry of the idea outwards and feeding back in critique so that the idea st strengthens itself. What this does is it kind of bypasses the normal authority structures that are set up in a system which usually exist to maintain confirmation bias. That's what authority structure does. You say, we already know what we know. Everything we see looks like what we know. Anything that doesn't look like what we know must be wrong. We're going to ignore that. We're going to do what we know. Which means we're going to produce things just like things we've already produced. And we will continue to do that until catastrophic failure. Um, which is the arc of most organizations. The arc of most uh, companies is to continue to do what they do until catastrophic failure. Um, so this diagram, this way of sort of incorporating creativity into the system is almost a way of introducing mutation into a form that otherwise will become extinct. So at the personal level, what's going on here, of course, you have a bunch of people, just like the people in this room. Nobody in this room has been magically transformed by uh, the conversation we're having here today, but almost everybody in this room now has a secondary geometry of thought installed in their brain based on the intrinsic value of nature. So were you all to be on my team, I would now have this extraordinarily diverse chemistry between my idea represented in the pinky color and any single individual's self-image, self-history, and personally held set of beliefs represented by the yellow. And there's all these points of intersection. And while you're driving to work, while you're eating breakfast, while you're talking to your friends, your associative functions are grinding away, grinding away, grinding away. And every Monday morning, people walk in and go, you know, I was surfing, and I thought of this thing. I thought of this thing about the project. I thought we could do a thing. It's like the wave, you know? I don't surf. I've never surfed in my life. I could never have this experience. I could never have this insight. I could never find the benefit of this insight unless I had this mechanism to harvest the free association of people involved with the project. The reason it works is you could still have that thought, but not recognize that the thought was relevant unless you have this diagrammatic geometry installed. So you go, oh, intrinsic value of nature. It's the wave, it's like the wave, because the wave does this, and they're all the same, but they're different, and blah, 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 and that could be the way we design the information system. I'm never gonna come to that conclusion. That's not me, that's somebody else on my team. And this just multiplies and multiplies and multiplies, so it vastly enriches the unpredictable feedback loop of input into the system, which is completely separate from the executive loop, which is very deterministic. That's why it's really valuable. And it has this extraordinary ability to modify missions. Missions are, for the most part, executive. A business, any business, all of our businesses, we set out to do things. Um, and usually we set out to do them, you know, for logical reasons. We need to grow, we need to put out information, we need to recognize profit. And there's a business plan, and there's a diagrammatic of what the thing needs to be, and that all exists, and that can become a kind of mission. What we are trying to do is to displace that so that the physical mission of what you know you're going to do, whether it is build a car, an exhibit, a building, a party, 
whatever the physical thing you thought you were there to do becomes a means instead of an end, a means of expressing the core set of values that you've all bought into. And what this does is it throws things very strangely sideways from where they would normally go. I'll talk about one other project here just to make this clear. I did this yesterday for the business guys, but just imagine how utterly mundane, utterly banal, utterly unexceptional the premise of a 15-story beachfront hotel on the coastline of Oahu could be. There couldn't be a more boring proposal of what to do. If you buy land on the coast of Oahu and attempt to recover your investment through running a hospitality business, a calculator will tell you that you will build a 15-story beachfront hotel. It will have 15 stories because there's a skyline cap and there's a setback. So on a site that you could buy, you end up with 15 stories. You end up with about 1,000 rooms. You end up with a lobby that can hold so many people. You end up with a buffet restaurant, a nice sit-down restaurant, a spa, a place for the kids, two pools, one for the grown-ups and one for the families. You know, this, that's what you get. That's what those are. This is looking one way down the coast, and this is looking the other way down the coast. Why would anyone enter this line of business with any hope of competing, and yet the Disney company announced to itself, we would like to build, guess what, a 15-story beachfront hotel on the island of Oahu. How can you possibly make this thing distinguish itself from anything else on Oahu? All of these are material expressions of a material mission that is described in material terms. None of these are expressions of some kind of narrative thematic goal that uses them to accomplish a goal. Interestingly, the marketing narrative of Hawaii departs entirely from this ideal. When you look at how Hawaii is distinguished from other beachy locations, indigenous Hawaiians are used as the signifier. In order to make sure that you understand this is not Phuket, this is not Bali, this is not the north coast of Australia, nor is it the Philippines, nor is it Palau, nor is it Malibu, nor is it the Caribbean. It's Hawaii. How do I signify that? With Hawaiians. Therefore, by process of deduction, the only thing that distinguishes Hawaii from other beachfront locations is Hawaiians. Therefore, a trip to Hawaii is a trip to Hawaiian. So once you get this idea that Hawaiians are the destination, which is what we did, that moves to the center. This will become a place about the premise that what makes Hawaii Hawaii are Hawaiians. It is still a 15-story beachfront hotel. It still has all the components it's going to have. We still spend the same amount of money that we would spend to build a 15-story beachfront hotel. But we now have a prejudicial decision tree that says no detail goes into this hotel that has not been vetted, discussed, or declared by indigenous Hawaiians. So suddenly, there's this whole group of indigenous Hawaiians who show up, who are involved with the project, like a hundred of them. Thought leaders, priests, writers, philosophers, professors, artists, sculptors, musicians, and we basically take what it is they want to say and turn it into the entire physical appearance of what we're gonna build anyway and end up with a place that is remarkably distinguished from any other place and that rewards the actual expectation that made you choose to go to Hawaii and not the Caribbean, which is Hawaiians. So it's really interesting. So the art program for this entire thing is not determined by us, not, not us at all, but literally offering up huge surface areas of this building to become the art program by which Hawaiians speak about what it means to be in Hawaii. It's the United States of America. It is illegal to hire people on the basis of race, creed, religion, etc., but it is not illegal to stop them from applying for jobs. So if you are the first company to ever build a resort facility predicated on the idea that only indigenous Hawaiians get to describe Hawaii, guess who shows up to work applying for jobs? Lots of Hawaiians. So 80% of the people who opened this resort had never worked in a resort before because you can teach people how to pour wine and dress a bed. You cannot teach them to be Hawaiian. So now, 
Your whole urge in coming to Hawaii is modeled by this image of Hawaiians. A trip to Hawaii is a trip to Hawaiians. You get to this resort, it is filled with Hawaiians who are standing right there next to you, and they are not once upon a time loincloth Hawaiians from some imaginary spectacle. They're actual Hawaiians, you know, who live today and who create contemporary works of art and contemporary expressions of that culture that you could actually use when you go off into the islands and when you learn what, what you're about. So it's very much about a living culture. So th in order for people to understand this, you still have to signify it. You still have to build into the place itself the connotation that this place signifies. Um, again, back to primal things. We're very, very highly evolved to detect agency, meaning somebody touched that. That's not a natural occurrence. I'm walking with my little, you know, my little primate ancestors. We're hiking along in the savanna, and we come to like 14 stones, the same size, stacked in a straight line. That's not an accident. You really pay attention to that. You're like, ooh, that could mean any number of horrible things or good things, but it's not an accident. So through the design, you're trying to signify to the viewer immediately, this is not an accident. This is not random. This is deliberate, this is intentional, this place intends to signify and intends to mean. That is why it is so frankly shrine-like, um, the lobby of this place. You cannot walk in here, at least out of our sample audience who's coming here, without sensing, oh my golly, this really must be important. And then of course it's packed with information, packed so densely with information, it can't possibly be understood without turning and asking questions of somebody. And when you turn to ask questions of that person, who do they turn out to be? But that's right. So now your trip to Hawaii really is a trip to Hawaiians because there you are standing there having a discussion with a Hawaiian person about what but a bunch of Hawaiian stuff, which I think is pretty cool. We have, uh, this is our little Olela room. It's a bar based around learning the Hawaiian language. We're the first resort ever, ever, this is kind of shocking and terrible, in the history of Hawaii to have a Hawaiian language requirement uh, for the key personnel working in the resort. And all of this is predicated around this idea. And I want to be clear, this resort has a lobby, a thousand rooms, a nice restaurant, a buffet restaurant, a spa, a couple bars, two pools, and some beachfront, just like every other resort in Hawaii. The only difference is that the entire thing is colored by its narrative premise, and this leads to some really peculiar events. And I will close with this, just because I think it is so illustrative of how far from the obvious you can be driven by using this associative mechanism um, instead of just a logical forward plow. This is uh, the Pico Stone, the navel stone of this resort, Aulani. Um, when we were going to build it, it was an empty field. It had once been a sugarcane plantation, and God knows how many centuries prior to that, it had been a uh, you know, Hawaiian cultural area. So there are Hawaiians who are in charge of this. There was a woman. Her name is Auntie Neti. She's a kahu, which is kind of like a high priest. And she's in charge of all this land. So of course, if we're going to make this be Hawaiian, we go to Auntie Nettie, uh, who's the local keeper of tradition of this place. And we asked her uh, to go do the ceremonial walking of the land that she would do and to find the navel, the center of the land. So she comes back to us and she says, this is the spiritual center of this land right here. We mark it with a construction stake. It's not the physical center, but the spiritual center of this piece of land. And then as we do all of our plans, we just avoid it so we could create a little quiet spot around it, about eh, half the size of this room with the you know, spot in the middle. And we build and we build. And we build a whole 15-story beachfront resort with the spa and the pool and all that stuff. And like a month before we open, Auntie Nady comes to me, because I'm kind of like the kahu of the Disney people. Um, and she's like, you need to find a stone to mark the Pico spot. And of course, by then, I know enough about Hawaiian culture. By the way, I grew up in the Hawaiian Islands, and I have Hawaiian cousins and all that stuff, but I never knew half of this stuff. I mean, the Hawaiian cosmology is really deep, like Tibetan cosmology. Um, so I'm like, oh, where am I going to find a stone? Oh, man, I know I can't go someplace else and take a stone. That's not Hawaiian. So the stone has to come from here, and we just buried this entire site under 20 feet of fill and build a hotel on top of it. 
So where am I going to find a stone? Suddenly remember that two years prior, this is a very Hawaiian story, two years prior, when we were clearing the site, they were loading up all these big chunks of fossilized coral that they were excavating as they dug the foundations onto a big truck. And they're going to drive them off to the dump. And I said, no, 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 don't do that. And the foreman's like, well, why not? I said, well, I have no idea. I really don't know, but don't do it. It does not seem right. Uh, so they didn't do it. They just dumped them into the parking lot area where all the construction workers parked, and they sat there for two years until this moment. We're like, that's, I will find a stone there. So I go to this gigantic pile of stone, which is completely unstable, climbing all over it. I could have completely killed myself. Uh, and these are refrigerator-sized rocks, and I don't find a thing. They're all nasty and broken and they look terrible. And on my way back to the car, I see this thing, and someone's using it as a traffic divider. And I'm like, that stone is really cool. That stone has lava rock in it, so it's part volcanic. It's, part, it's got fossilized coral animals in it, so it has a record of life. I like this stone. So we call Auntie Nettie. She comes and does her prayers. And then the other Hawaiian guys come, and they bathe the rock, and they wrap it up in coconut fiber, and they lift it by hand, and they carry it, and they plant it, and they do all their ceremonies. And people start leaving real offerings in front of this stone. So this is why I think this is so interesting. The premise of building a 15-story beachfront hotel by a giant international company with deep vested interest in protecting its intellectual property results in a place that is so embedded in Hawaiian culture that were we to tear down this entire resort, we would be forbidden from touching this stone. The stone no longer belongs to us, but in fact now belongs to Hawaiian culture and will be sitting there when this resort has crumbled into dust and is gone. That's pretty interesting for the difference between a material intention and the potential expression that comes from imposing this narrative diagram. And it is because of experiences like that that I am so convinced that this method of organizing work is a way to sort of artificially install into the group the same kind of creative impulses that are happening in your brain when you seek to try to accomplish something that is different from what has been accomplished before. And I think it comes from two things. One, I think it comes from the geometry. The geometry of associative thought that pushes your perception slowly sideways off from what would have been the logical assumptions. And two, from the artificial bicultural status that is imposed on every member of the team, where they are now simultaneously themselves with everything they know and everything they believe, and a member of this culture which knows and believes this small set of ideas. And though these ideas may contradict each other, one of the earmarks of creativity is that ambiguous ability to hold two ideas to be true at the same time. And it's out of that that the ideas come that make these places so unique. And I do not believe that this is something that needs to be limited to what we do at all. I think it's imminently teachable. I think it's transferable. I think it works. And I think it could be useful to people all over the place in all kinds of uh, modes of expression. And that is what I have to say about that. The floor is now open for questions. They will approach you if you have a question so that you can be given a microphone. Yes, Andy. Morning, thank you very much. Um, you were telling us, uh, sorry, I'm Andy Giger from uh, Science Center Singapore. Uh, you were telling us how powerful it is to tap into the primal associations of everyone to tell a narrative. Um, and you were using your, your uh, nature conservation message as an as a example. I was wondering where you were going after you got people in the right direction uh, following your, your narrative. Because I think one of the issues with uh, nature conservation is that people think of nature as something outside and separate from us. And, um, with tapping into the, the, the primal associations, you sort of reinforce that sort of thing. 
yes, nature is earthly colors. It's uh, all um, smooth shapes and, and all that sort of thing. But how, how do we then bring them back and say, no, actually, you are nature as well. And you need to um, identify with nature. Did, did you? So we have several, several, um, several thrusts. Just speaking of Animal Kingdom in particular. So um, Animal Kingdom, its primary high function is generating enthusiasm. It's not a particularly effective pedagogical machine because of a, a variety of factors. However, because of the relatively unstructured nature of the show, because of everything, um, we have lots of opportunity for face-to-face -face conversation. And we have lots of people whose task is nothing more than to be present in the environment talking to you about what you see and, and what you might want to do. We tend to direct people to very localized efforts that they can do in their own home, in their own town, when they, when they go away. So, that, so we're trying to get it to go from this grand romantic image down to something very applied that people could take home with them. And then secondarily, we have the Disney Worldwide Conservation Fund, which they're certainly free to donate money to, but that's really a one-step thing. So the primary thing we're trying to do with these personal interactions, which are conversational, which are non-scripted, and which can follow any path you want, is to direct people back home to something they can do that they have control over. Now, that's very incremental. It's not necessarily a vast political change. It's small incremental change, but it sets up another one of those diagrammatics, and out of that comes a smaller number of people who are very motivated, and those people then become politically effective, and that indeed has happened. Does that make sense? Oh, Terry and I have to run to catch a plane to go back home, uh, but I just wanted to say, and to all of you, I'll say, Joe and I have known each other before this meeting, uh, but we haven't seen each other for quite a while, and uh, it's, it's just such a great pleasure to see him again, because he's such an interesting, uh, I would even say spiritual person, and uh, that, that is just a terrific talk. Thank you. I, we heard it yesterday, we heard it again today, uh, and it gets better the second time. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's really a talk worth listening to thank twice. You. So we want to thank Mir Mirabelle as well for uh, giving us a chance to see one another again. Thank you very much. And of course, I very much enjoy you know, working with Nancy and being slid into an MRI machine. That was a big adventure. Oh, that was just the poacher scene. There's a poacher yeah. scene. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great pleasure. Next question, please. I can't believe it. Yes. Hi, Joe. I'm uh, TM from Singapore, and thank you for a very inspiring talk. Um, you show us how different narratives may not match. And uh, it's interesting when you talk about the bicultural overlapping and so on. Now, when you're doing a project, you certainly have a timeline to say that, okay, we, we're going to finalize this thing and we're going to move on. So typically, when and who will say that, yes, this interface and this intersection, this, this, inter this kind of in intersection and coming up with a new narrative is the one? Because you said that yeah, the yeah. center of the idea, the center is the idea. But some have to make that decision. Who will make that decision? So typically, uh, one of my jobs as the leader is to guide the process by which the team derives this core set of narratives. That process, honestly done, takes weeks. Um, you don't want, because again, the moment you commit, this subconscious confirmation bias stuff goes into work, and it becomes harder and harder to actually recognize honest contradiction. You don't want to commit too early. It's a trick, right? You could, but you don't want to. So you dwell and dwell and converse and converse. 
And what happens is, and there's a bunch of exercises, but what happens is, in general, certain ideas continue to re-emerge each time you take a slice. Like there's one slice you can do where you go, all right, let's just take the three primary object, subject, like, like animals, landscape, and plant life. And I want to see as many adjectives as I can that describe these things. Now erase the subject completely, only look at these adjectives, and now I want to see as many actions as these adjectives might be able to describe. Now erase the adjectives, and I want to see as many places as these actions might take place. So what you're basically doing is trying to lead your own conscious mind really far away from the core base assumption through a series of exercises. And they begin to surface common themes. And this takes some time. It's very literary crit kind of thing. But over time, it becomes pretty obvious that there's, let's say there's six or seven of them. But of the six or seven, there's three or four that are operable. Because there may be some that are like, yeah, that's great, but how in the world could you build to that? You could build to this one, that one, and that one. Those are buildable. We're taking those. So indeed, you do leave conceptual work on the table because it's not buildable. And you, you, you strip down to what you can do. But it, it takes some time, and it is a series of exercises. And the exercises are designed to distract you from what you would, because everybody wants to just go, oh, oh, it'll be like a zoo. And we'll do this, and then, there, you know, it'll be, and then you can do that in a day. But then you end up with one of those white towers on the beach that looks <laughs> like everybody else's white tower. So it takes time, but it does not take a lot of people. Like, boy, not a lot of people. You know, by the way, the whole concept of brainstorming in large groups was debunked within five years of being announced to the market as a thing. It's not a thing. The only form of cooperative developmental behavior that has statistics to back it up is dyadic, that is pairs. There is no statistical evidence to substantiate any <laughs> other form of idea generation with data other than pairs. No matter what you read in one of those little 45-page airplane books that you buy on the business shelf, just <laughs> so you know. Yeah, creative collaborations are in, in duos. Yeah, there are big examples on that. Uh, Graham. Uh, Graham Walker at the Australian <laughs> National University. Um, you talked about Okay. Positive emotions, I can't do um, and you know, obviously, especially in the science center world, we use positive emotions to I guess engage people a lot. But we just heard reference to that rhino picture, and that that's you know, it's very clearly laid out. Probably not to bring up positive emotions. I, I wonder what you thought about using negative emotions, yeah. especially when we're trying to drive behavior change and things like that. I, I, I don't. I, there are two things going on. Okay. Um, one of them is emotional charging, which is, in fact, does not all have to be positive. Um, you have to be careful how you frame negative emotions, just careful how you frame them so you don't fall into this hopeless abyss. Um, but you can frame negative emotions. They are motivating, and a lot of people are motivated by anger, motivated by a sense of, motivated to be involved. Um, secondarily, we have to acknowledge in this context of this place that we are telling a story that is true and unresolved. And because it is true and unresolved, the narrative is open to engagement. You can be involved in this narrative. It's not over, it's not finished. It is open. That's the second value of that. The other positive emotion simply comes from the correlation itself. The s now I'm gonna, this is gonna be, I'm stepping outside of my professional sphere, but this is what I think is really going on, that it is a neurological function. We want to find patterns, and in the outside world, it is very difficult to find patterns that logically make sense. There's tons of Brownian motion, tons of contradictory information. When you enter a place, where a designer has predetermined that nothing exists except actions and objects that correlate and rhyme, 
the brain still believes it is discovering these things. The brain doesn't have, just like with fiction, just like with the paradox of fiction, we cry when, you know, the little mermaid, you know, loses her voice. We cry at these movies when we know full well. The thing I'm watching never happened. The people who I'm watching are not real. The events that led to this movie being on a screen are entirely commercial, and I'm still somehow emotionally engaged. In the same sense, in a, the physical environment, I am still engaged. I'm engaged by the rhyme structure itself, the correlation itself, regardless of the positive or negative quality of the story. And I think that is chemical, literally chemical. It is dopamine, serotonin, the release of chemicals that reward the work that normally goes into figuring this out. Only that work was done by designers already, but your brain doesn't know that. Just like your brain can't tell the difference between a sad movie and a sad event. So the other positive emotion is simply the reward structure of narrative itself happening when you're in this space. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, well, um, every narrative should have a long distance travel. That means a component which comes up, maybe which even was uh, in, uh, unintentional. I think one long distance travel could be that you hand over, I think, the, the hotel, the beach resort, I think, to the Hawaiian and not to keep any ownership. So this would be, of course, a consequence. But on the other side, it would be very interesting to understand uh, how you measure, I think, the social impact on your investment now employing in Hawaiian people in a very consequent way. So do you measure, for instance, the social impact in terms of education rates, in terms of better health condition, in terms of how to say the second generation the kids of the, the workers, what they are going to do. So what sort of social impact does the Hawaiian resort have? Yeah. Okay, so in the case of Disney's Animal Kingdom, where we actually have a curatorial staff, we are able to do those measurements because we have a curatorial staff whose job is to follow and to measure and to track those things because it is, in a sense, an educational facility. In the case of the hotel, we don't. Um, we... we what we have is mostly, I would say, implicit in the sense that you may know this, you know, Hawaiians are not very fond of large scale resort developments along the coast. And typically these resort developments and especially something by somebody like us would be the object of a lot of political scrutiny, opposition, tension, antipathy. None of that has manifested itself. So there is, if you will, uh, a negative indicator. But we don't have a mechanism for actually measuring as an educational facility the positive impact, although I hear it anecdotally all the time because we do get what we, we do record what you would call guest, guest reactions. Uh, and those are very positive. Um, but we don't have a formal way, as we do at Animal Kingdom, of tracking and measuring the actual pedagogy. Well, but you know, I think you can make easily a social business out of it. And that you really highlight, I think, the social impact you have. And there are measurement systems in place, and maybe we can talk about yeah, how yeah. you can, let's say, underline the impact you have in terms of society, in society. I will say anecdotally that after we opened this hotel, there was a wave of Hawaiian cultural efforts in all those other 15-story <laughs> beachfront hotels. You know, all of a sudden, everybody's got a cultural interpreter and an extra Hawaiian room and stuff like that. But that tends to be a classic market impact of one of our, because our, our, our enterprises are so heavily invested with so much money that whether it's legitimate or not, other businesses will go, well, what did they do? Oh, oh they're doing that, we should do some of that, right? But we don't have yet any way of truly measuring it. And by the way, ultimately, for the company, it is still a kind of an entertainment product. I'm very interested because I think it has had a lot of impact, a lot of impact. And certainly it has impact socially on the area of the coast where we built the hotel, which is the highest concentration of Hawaiians in Hawaii, and also one of the poorest areas on the island. And it's one of the primary areas we hired from. So I know we've had at least some social and economic impact in that sense. Anyway, but there, that's a long conversation. Over on this side, I saw a hand. Hi, uh, Joe. I'm Daniel Tan from Science Center Singapore. Just a bit of a design question. Earlier you shared with us that the Animal Kingdom is 
realistic fiction and we hear that in the intro that you'll be working on or you are working on Avatar, which is fantasy. So will that be a contradiction? Is that a challenge in design and... So that's a good question. I mean, it's sort of a... Uh, um, so if you've seen the film, Avatar, uh, the film is very clearly a metaphor about the commercial relationship to natural resources and the impact on indigenous people, right? What makes the film interesting is a plot structure about a guy and his personal transformation and a love interest and a big battle scene, all that stuff. Uh, but what the film is actually about is a metaphor uh, about things that are playing themselves out in the world right now in South America, Papua New Guinea, big mining companies versus indigenous people, blah, blah, blah. So what we've done, because it is ancient, so classic, right? Anything that goes into Animal Kingdom can only be an expression of the value system that is the grid by which anything gets into Animal Kingdom. So Avatar at Animal Kingdom is only about the intrinsic value of nature, transformation through adventure, and a personal call to action. Now, how many people have seen the movie Avatar? So I'm gonna say that again. The intrinsic value of nature, the idea that nature is a value against which no value can be held up by comparison and, and succeed, Transformation through adventure, the idea that adventure is a path of personal transformation, not simply physical challenge, and a personal call to action. I would submit to you that that's exactly what the movie is about. Um, and so as long as we restrain the movie itself to those thematic elements, it slides in perfectly as a giant metaphor into Animal Kingdom, and then our visual treatment is believe me, because it's painfully difficult, extremely photoreal, extremely photoreal. And every element that is being built is being deliberately linked to a terrestrial element that it can be compared to. So that where the metaphor in the film is oblique and left implicit, in the land it can be very implicit, very explicit, and very directly linked to real learning uh, capacities. And that's kind of how it will work. Joe, hi, it's Jim from the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, thanks for an exciting talk. <laughs> um, I'm just interested in the, um, the mechanisms you have in place to manage organizationally the realities of maintaining the illusion. Uh, I th I'm thinking back to your point about the, the leopard in the grass. Once you see the thing that disrupts the pattern, you can't unsee it. So in creating these environments that are so absolutely immersive, where everything is singular without vision. What do you do when real people take over and run these places? It stops it all falling away when something is out of place. Right. Um, a, the Disney company in general, and we, of course, obsess about precisely this problem constantly. Um, constantly. And it, it leads to very twee little arguments about like how to treat a phone booth, you know, and what do you do with the charging station, and, you know, do we or do we not allow the polished stainless steel surface of the drink machine to be exposed or not? A lot of the answer is simple visual framing, framing the context by which you finally get to the object that you are seeing. Because Animal Kingdom has the benefit of posing its narrative as contemporary. So it's not once upon a time, it's not, you know, jolly old Africa, pith helmet, white mustache. It's right now today. So we have this get out of jail free card. We have this escape valve of being able to say, the municipality of our Swahili coastal estuarian village, which sits at the end of this savanna, has decided to install freshwater drinking uh, for the benefit of tourists, and that is why this is here. So then it becomes just an issue of labeling and framing. Um, and then we, we do, in fact, deny ourselves certain opportunities that would be contradictory because over the years, as a company, we have discovered that the, it's not worth it. The value we get out of creating these extraordinarily harmonic places greatly outweighs the value we would reap 
by violating them for the purpose of some momentary profit or convenience. We've tried it uh, and experienced dramatic challenges and had to come back around and reinvest in pulling ideas back inside this narrative concept. So in general, I don't experience too much of it. What, what, what kind of policing goes on into just dealing with things like, I don't know, the maintenance guy leaves his bucket or his kind of sprinkler head visible, all those kinds of things. How, do, how does that mechanism happen on a day-to-day -day basis? Right, so, so you mean like just how a park runs? And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, these parks are very, very loaded with operators. Yeah. People tend to actually behave, you know, we have a particular culture that is our culture of people who come. And they behave in general pretty well. I personally, as a design leader, I, there's this point in any design when people are, you know, uh, you're looking at the prototypes and you're looking at the situation and I will just make believe that I am a mean, rambunctious 15-year-old boy and I'll grab stuff and try to break it and try to see, can I break this? I might as well break it now you know, before somebody pulls it off the wall later. So we do a little bit of that, and we have armies of people before it ever gets into the park who are like, no, 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 see that right there? That, you can't have that. That has to be more rounded. You can't have, you gotta lower this by two inches because the average height of little kids' eyeballs, blah, 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 all of that stuff. And there's quite a few operators in this park, but the real answer is people inside these systems behave pretty well, I really think, because they're sort of in the swirl of this mood, right? You don't get a lot of, you don't get, considering what you could get, you don't get a lot of it. I really attribute it to the design, I do. Hi, Joe, I'm over here. Oh, there you are. I'm Guy from Science North in Canada. Um, so Disney and you obviously have 50 years or 30 years of credibility and proof of concept. I've been to Animal Kingdom and I've experienced it and completely understand the approach that you've described and the impact it's had and the success that it's brought to Disney. But I imagine when you first thought about this, you had some, some you know, uphill battles to go. And the, the concentric circles that you showed where you had various peoples on, the, on that spectrum. So think of an organization that's never experienced this before. How, how do you get started? What is, the, what is the path that you follow that allows the organization, especially the corporate part of the organization, to say, you know what, we're, we're not going to do the same thing here. We're going to create something completely different. Where we end up, we don't know, but trust us, it's going to be good. It's going to be work. That's, right. A lot of a lot of tough slogging to do and a lot of uphill work. So, so uh, that diagram is very, very important. The the this notion of enthusiasm to dissent um, is really, really important. And what you need to try to do eventually, and you may not be able to do this on the first day, is distribute expertise along that axis. It does you no good if all the enthusiastic people are all artists and all the dissenters are all business investment people. That's not a very healthy diagram, right? You need to distribute people along this axis. There is a common cultural mistake that I think a lot of creative people make uh, when they are talking about ideas, and it is a kind of lack of empathy for who's listening. When creative people talk to each other, about their ideas. There's this huge vested backlog of knowledge, of expertise, and a set of assumptions. The ideas tend to be discussed very focused on their novelty, on, on the sort of extreme aspect of the idea, what makes this so outrageously not like the other idea, what makes this new, what makes this really, really intense, really potent, right? You look at the brain diagrams of how creative people process, and you look at those intense red zones, so you got red zone people talking to red zone people about everything that's in the red zone. But when you try to do that to a business person, and I'm talking about a, not a, you know, and there's this whole mythology about the little elf creative people and the bad money people and complete lies. Um, you're talking to a person 
who is a business person, who is vested in process, vested in order, vested in structure, vested in responsibility. You cannot talk to them about that idea all on the basis of this red zone kind of, you know, extreme. Because what happens is, it's not that they're like, oh, you're just crazy and this will never happen. It is that they think, oh, this person is very creative, but very subjective and passionate. Therefore, I must interpose myself into this system, and I must bring the structure, I must bring the order, I must bring the, stru the structure and the authority to make this thing happen, but in so doing, screw the whole thing up, and it ends up unexceptional and repetitious. Therefore, the creative person, this is one of the values of this method of development, is that when you talk it, it comes out sounding really logical, really structured, really logical. So you lead with exactly this kind of logical structure. You go, look, this project is gonna be based on a set of assumptions. We've done the work to validate that these assumptions are, are usable. And just think, just like what I did here, think about this idea. If it means this, it would mean that. And if it means this, that would mean this. So you have a business person listening, and the first thing they think is, huh, that sounds logical. That sounds actually logical. So it isn't actually logic. I don't know how many people in here are like logic philosophers, but everything I'm doing here is inductive. It is not deductive. Why? Because I interpose the foundational thought. But business people are also not philosophers. So once you interpose that thought and start, it looks like logic. And it is, from that point further, it is logical. So first, the guy will appreciate that you are attempting to explain the project logically, which puts you in a very small class of creative people compared to the broad population. Second, because it's logical, it sounds responsible. Like, oh, this is responsible. And half the times, my experience is they're like, Logical argument, responsible guy, I'm good, I'm good. Keep talking, you keep talking, I'm busy. We're gonna do these other things because I'm gonna give you the money because you're at least you're a responsible, logical person. The next person coming into this room is crazy, right? So a lot of it has to do with how you speak. And in so speaking, you listen really hard when the guy says, I follow your logic up to this point, but, you can't, we have no paradigm that shows how people would ever say, for example, purchase tickets in this format. And then you really do have to listen and go, okay, that is a point. But what's happened is all the critique is already being channeled towards the effectiveness of the idea. What you're doing is moving that person inwards from dissent to facilitation. You go, oh, that's very interesting. We will work on that. We will come back to you. We will show you a proposal. You're trying to move this person inward until suddenly one day, I mean, I had precisely this happen with the leader of Walt Disney World long ago who was a fiercely conservative man. And this is a time when I had hair down to my belt and the last person in the world you would expect to have any empathetic relationship with this man. Um, and he was opposed to the project. And I had to fly down to Florida to do a presentation of this project to this guy. And I knew him, and he knew me. And I put on a suit, because he's a conservative guy with a tie, you know. I'm gonna go make a business proposal to a conservative guy in his office, which is like the big important office. I'm gonna wear a suit. I have like one suit in my life. So I got a tie and I got my suit and I got my giant long hair back and a ponytail and I walk into the room, I swear to God this is true, this man is sitting there in shorts and a Hawaiian shirt with a giant clip-on earring in his ear. <laughs> That's the truth. And I do my pitch. This is what we're doing. This is how we think it works. This is why we think it works. This is the structure of thinking. This is how we believe we've answered operational concerns. Blah, 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 blah. Very logical structured presentation. At the end of the presentation, this guy goes, you've answered all my questions. I am no longer concerned. I will back this project. All there. But you never get there if you have this mythic notion that the whole relationship is oppositional anyway. 
It's not compositional. It's not oppositional. It's very, very rare to have an actual mean guy who's the business person, who's actually malevolent. That's just not how it is. That's not what it is. So you have to be empathetic and try to express the idea in terms of who you're talking to. I don't know how to answer it better than that. And that actually tends to work pretty well. And then you get reciprocal action coming the other way. It works pretty well. Questions? Yes. Yes, you. Uh, the, yes. Hi, Joe. Uh, jo, sorry. Uh, I'm Shamini. I'm from Kuala Lumpur, PetroScience specifically. My question revolves around that, uh, that hotel, Alani. Yeah, um, from the commercial sense, it's got very good appeal with, with that Hawaiian framing theme going on. Uh, but my question revolves around um, the minority context, right? Uh, racial discrimination to be in particular. Um, what kind of a signal are you sending out from the Disney perspective, you know, uh, by focusing on, on this area? And uh, um, how do you hand, or have you been labeled by any quarters as being racially discriminative in that sense? Or does it really matter? How do you handle yeah. the situation? So if you back up and look at the context of Hawaii itself, peculiar history to Hawaii. Um, you know, it's historical process by which it was absorbed into the United States of America is very unique. Um, and so the position of Hawaiians in Hawaii compared to a lot of indigenous people in the American sphere is also very unique uh, because um, not really a military conquest. Uh, typically in America, frankly, the rest of the United States of America, there's a military conquest. Indigenous people are rounded up. They're put on a reservation. The centralized government facilitates and funds the establishment of infrastructure and subsidizes the movement of people to occupy the territory the indigenous people used to occupy, and they now are categorized on a reservation. None of this stuff happens in Hawaii. So you have indigenous people spread all over, kind of randomly spread through the society. But they, they, there's no avenue for um, self-determination of the narrative of, of who they are. So visit, visitors come to the island, and I do believe that a substantial number of these visitors are looking for a real experience of something real, because that's the faith, right? They must be coming for something real, but they can't find it, because it's not really being provided. So what we're trying to do is just create a platform that allows a conversation to be more controlled by people who own the subject matter, which are, for the most part, indigenous Hawaiians. Now, in Hawaii, because of everything I've said, that's a very broad category. A lot of people trace their ancestry back to being Hawaiian and will claim Hawaiian ancestry who you wouldn't know to look at them. As a matter of fact, a room full of people like this, virtually everyone in this room, could look like someone who claimed their ancestry from a native Hawaiian particularly, particularly Hawaiian, and they're Hawaiian. Um, so what you're trying to do is, give, is to sort of us, the Disney company, step out of the picture where we become sort of the invisible facilitators of a conversation that is really taking place between visitors and Hawaiians, which is predominantly uh, carried forth through the arts, builds the resort, so there's a kind of implicit voice in there. And then through whatever conversational relationships happen with the staff who are predominantly local for a variety of reasons, including their desire to work in a place that at least has some dignity and respect for what they might want to say about themselves. And then we just kind of kick them out of there. We get our get out of there and let people meet people and talk to people, let people see the stuff and ask questions not to interpose ourselves as a interpretive function and in between. Um, because then I do think you get into, oh, now we're getting into the weeds. Oh, sticky. So we don't want to be in there. We do have our own little presence. There are a few Disney characters who appear sometimes, 
All of them are positioned as if they too are tourists. So they too are there to learn, to be instructed, to have experience. None of them interpose themselves as interpreters of culture. The people who interpret culture are the owners of that culture. Now, Sorry. Um, if there's a race, I'm just curious to know. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just curious to know if you've been you've been labeled by certain quarters, you know, by you know by you being know, the bad. The one critique we received, because again, I think this is really interesting. When I was young, Hawaiian culture was probably at its absolute nadir. You know, it was. This is the '60s, right? It was. It, it really went through a remarkable renaissance uh, in the '70s and '80s. We committed ourselves to a certain idea, and that is the idea that Hawaiian culture is a contemporary culture entitled to contemporary self-expression, and that these people, therefore, who are around you and the art that you see is legitimately Hawaiian, but contemporary, expressing the idea of a living people who are with us today, who have something to say about being alive today. There is a subcategory of people in the intellectual framework of Hawaii who say, what is legitimately Hawaiian is that which was Hawaiian before the first Europeans set foot on these shores, and that is all that it is Hawaiian. So by virtue of being contemporary, this stuff is illegitimate because it is compromised by contact with outside influences and is therefore not Hawaiian. And, and by the way, I think that that is perfectly legitimate and clear as a critique. Um, but in order to create a piece of narrative, you do indeed have to commit yourself to some narrative thematic premise, and our premise is precisely the contemporaneity of Hawaiian culture, and therefore, we have to leave these critics to their critique, right? You have to, they are entitled to their critique. It's a legitimate conversation that Hawaiians can have with Hawaiians about the position of Hawaiian culture in the modern world. Is not our place to engage that critique. That is a critique for Hawaiians to engage. Um, in general, we've had strong support for what we've done. But as I say, there is this very specific critique which has to do with the whole premise of this show, of contact, uh, of contact. And so that, I think, is irreconcilable, really. Hi, I'm Martha from the BGC Public Art Program. Um, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. I want to be you when I grow up. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, what would you say is the most important part of the story? Like, if I had a limited budget to do an event or something, um, what should I focus on? What should I focus all my budget on? I think the internal, cohesive rhyme structure is the first thing thing you want to shoot for before plot, before any kind of um, message, the simple correlation of, boy, these things all come from the same spirit. These forms, these actions, these sounds come from the same place. Uh, and you feel that. You sense that. It's just a sensory sense that, boy, this really hangs together. And, and since it hangs together, it must intend to signify. Because clearly, it's full of intention. That's why it hangs together. And, and, and just get that. And then from there, you can add a single emotional message, a single intellectual message. And you've done more than most designers do. Because really, a lot of design is just, ooh, that's cool, and that's cool, too. Spaceships are cool, and I like dogs, and I like red. Who to have a red dog in a spaceship and just like completely, completely nuts. Um, so number one, I really do think is this sense of wow, whatever this is, it really hangs together. It hangs together. Um, do that first, and then you add whatever you can on top of that. You don't really. It is utterly detached from the question of budget. You could do this with a napkin. You need nothing to do this. It is an attitude about composition, not a material question of scope.
Hello, I'm Sanki Simbulan from Shell. I just like to um, know uh, how you continue to thrive. Uh, sorry, how you continue to nurture your own creativity. It seems like you have been blessed or born with this creativity. But how do you keep nurturing it? And also, how do you inspire others to be creative, especially those who are not so, you know, not probably born creative. Um, you know, people like me who work in a corporate setting, for example. Uh, but creativity is very useful anywhere in, in finding solutions. So how do you do that? Is it by going out there, exposing yourselves and making yourself uh, you know, have more opportunity to, to have free association? Yeah. So um, I do try, first of all, I try to kind of live out that diagram. You know, like, where can I go that is likely to not be like where I have been, to talk to people who are likely to not think the way I think, to see if maybe I'm totally crazy and this is just an obsession and none of this actually makes sense, so that I can either change it or strengthen it depending on what I hear. So I do consciously seek out dialogue. That's a thing. Uh, I travel a lot. I love to travel. I like to put myself out away from sustaining infrastructure, uh, you know, pretty far out. Uh, I mean, um, Maribel had mentioned I did this whole Mongolian expedition to raise money for snow leopard conservation. It was a pretty severe landscape to be in for an extended period of time. Um, so I, for me, generally, it has something to do with travel and removal from both the infrastructure and assumptions <coughs> that run the society inside of which we live. And what happens when you do that, of course, you never can come home. You never come home, because once you've been away, home just looks like another weird place, which is good for you if you're a creative guy. You want home to be strange and unfamiliar, right? Otherwise, you fall into the middle. So there's that. I am a compulsive student and a compulsive teacher, so I transmit a lot. And I try to find the company of really, really smart people uh, and just listen and learn. I take notes. I'm like a permanent grad student, you know, just, com just literally constantly. And by the side of my bed, it looks like somebody dumped out, I mean dumped out a library. It's just books, 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 books. I still believe in books, actual books, <laughs> books. Um, <laughs> So I do all of that. So I am, and this is probably, to be honest, just compulsive behavior. I mean, it's not like I chose to be this. I just do this. I read. I gravitate towards, love being here, smart people who know things about stuff. I love that. And to get away from the systems that cause you to not question the system, right? Get away from whatever, wherever you are, get away from there. Go someplace else. Thank you. Go from Petroscience Malaysia. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful talk. Give it a lot of things to think about. Uh, I'm asking you, let's say, uh, as a leader, and you are a project leader, I'm sure in all these projects, uh, if we are not like you, compulsive traveler and student, whatever, let's say we're not exact, exactly like you, and we want to lead and to ensure this, uh, um, you know, giving people enthusiasm to, to dissent. Can you give us some advice how we should lead as a leader in this group? Uh, okay. Um, all of this is just opinion. Uh, first of all, I think certain aspects of leadership, just like everything else I talked about, are really primal. Um, leaders need to create a safe environment. People will gravitate to safety. Right? I mean, just imagine this. Forget business. Forget that we all work in museums and pedagogical institutes and just imagine a forest. You know, people gravitate to safety. So you create safety. People will gravitate to safety. Second thing is, people are completely rudderless and mapless. So create a map. This is where we are. This is where we are going. This is what is there. This is why we're going. Nobody does that either. 
So people will gravitate to that. Just as if you were in a forest. Like, oh, he has a map. And, and it's, there's no bears by him. Well, let's go with him, right? So safety, a sense of direction. Then, and this is really important. I think a lot of people forget this. You need to instill in the group the same properties of leadership you yourself possess so that leadership is interchangeable. <coughs> Thing like, ooh, what happens if the leader sprains his ankle? Then we're all screwed, right? Unless the leader has taught everybody else, no, listen, if I sprain my ankle, this is what you do. Do this, do this, do this, don't do this, always do this like this, and we will get out of the forest to where the mango trees are without running into the leopards. So you have to make sure that leadership qualities are the general qualities of the group. I couldn't be standing here right now doing this. I have a multi-hundred million dollar project in development that's under construction right now. I couldn't do this if I didn't have people on my team who are totally fine. Like, yep, yep, got it, Joe's gone again, we know what we're doing, we know how to do it, right? <laughs> we know where we're going, Joe gets hit by a truck, we're cool. <laughs> fine, so you do that, right? And then I think there really is a kind of, as if, it, it, it has to do with this diagram. If you've laid out the logic, the framing, the associative framing of why we're here, where we think we're going, why we think we're going there, the other thing you want to provide is this range of freedom that is appropriate to the scale of where you are so that in general, the feeling people have is that they themselves are making independent decisions. They're not being told what to do. They're being told why to do things. And then they're free to do things. So they tend to feel a lot of autonomy. Um, and you, the leader, reap the benefit of this autonomy because it accrues to you. So, because you're the leader, right? But in fact, what's going on is the entire group is functioning as a self-organized autonomous thought. And it's all doing more or less the right thing. So your role as a leader becomes more like a guide, more like a, a editorial guide where you're, if you're doing anything, you're critiquing the validity of a person's independent decision. So I see that you have decided to design this wall in this way. But I don't understand yet how this wall fits into the framework of thought that we're trying to express. So you tell me how you think this fits. Da, 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 blah, 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 blah. Oh, oh, I understand. But if all that is true, then I think you need to take this wall and attenuate it a little bit and soften all these corners over here, and then that will pull it inside of the general view. The person, it's their wall, they designed it, they did it all. You're just sort of moving it closer to harmony. And what this does, it just creates a lot of autonomy. It's co totally scalable. I, I really do believe it's totally scalable. I don't believe that in a creative enterprise, um, it's pretty late in the game when you have to lock all those doors and go, look, you cannot keep doing graphic design now. We need to build signs. You know, you cannot, con you have to stop with the exhibit. We have to build the exhibit. You know, it now has to be built. But that, you can let that go pretty long. And I try to keep pushing autonomy down, 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 all the way down to the painters in the field so that you get vitality in the expression instead of just service. Um, you want vitality. Uh, you really want contribution, not just service. So to me, those are principles more than anything else. They're just principles. Uh, that are leadership principles, and I do use narrative for all of that. I do, for real. I do, and the, I'm not the only guy. Howard Gardner, you know, these guys will all talk about narrative and leadership, and it can be used, obviously can be used malevolently. Every dictator in the world knows that if you can control narrative, you can control society. That's an absolute fact. So you just don't have to be a dictator uh, for that to be true. Uh, may I have the last question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think it's the elephant in the room. Um, why do you think, if you, in your brutal, if it's at all brutal opinion, why do you think science museums lag f far behind theme parks in terms of attraction? When I'd like to, th I'd really like to think that 
the desire to understand as universal as the desire to be affected emotionally and to be, you know, and to be attracted to something emotionally. Okay. Th that, that, Where that, do we suck? Okay. Yeah. I don't mean, <laughs> I, I thought about that, so. <laughs> There's several layers of answer to this. Number one. When museums first became public institutions, generally in England and America, I'm not talking about private wunderkammers where six aristocrats a year go in to look at like snail shells. I'm talking about a public museum. That was done with a very paternalistic urge to discipline, educate, and lift the masses. So there's this, this underlying disciplinary vibe of lines and containment and you stand everywhere and you, you look at everything. It's very disciplinary, A, file that. B, there's that 18th century premise, which is tragically flawed, which if people just understand something, they'll care about it, which is utterly upside down from the way the human creature is designed. Completely backwards, right? Th that only works for like scientists. And I don't think it works for scientists. Most scientists study things they care about. Um, so the, the, the value equation is, tends to be upside down. So the push is very cognitive, very information biased, very if you only understood this, you'd think it was cool because you understood it, then you'd be excited. Instead of, this is really exciting, you should care about it, and then learn what you'd like to learn. So the curatorial urge, so this goes to, I'm sorry, this is a long answer, but you asked, so this is my answer. A, you have the disciplinary format of standing and walking in lines and regarding. It's not necessarily once upon a time, this was like the only air-conditioned building a person would be in, is not very different from peasants going into a church, right? Like, wow, look how big everything is, and they are glass. So that's all gone now, right? Um, so I think the actual physical format needs to be much more modeled on a living room than a school, A. I need to be in a place where I feel comfortable, socially comfortable, doing what I want to do, and that's like a living room with couches and tables and chairs and really different from this sort of chunk, 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 chunk disciplinary thing. B, I think you have to really make emotional appeals. First, the whole thing you said about beauty, this museum being about beauty and this sort of Philippine predisposition towards beauty, I think is right, right? So beautiful first, then sensible, right? Um, and then I think people now desire, uh, they want to touch things and be engaged with things. You can't, the, the tactility will always be a weapon against the virtual world um, you, to get people, but they are not going to touch things they don't care about. They're not going to touch things they don't, they're not motivated to touch. You're not going to convince them to engage it by telling them it's really important. And then the last thing I think is the learning isn't really happening in the museum. There's not enough follow-up. There's not enough of a relationship after you leave to connect with the actual learning process, which is this post experience I'm sorry, I've been talking without my mic. This post-experiential processing period where like four months after your visit, to the science museum, you're watching the drawbridge and you're like, oh, that's like, that's a linkage. Look at that. Oh, that's a linkage. I remember it. That's a linkage. Now you learned something. And you might have, you know, you weren't paying attention to the linkage. You're looking at like the skeleton collection. But you, so following up on the learning process and sort of facilitating the post visit process. And that, I think, is a valid place for mobile devices and digital connection and stuff, would help own the discovery when it does happen, which is not happening in the museum. So in general, I think that's kind of 
you have to kind of walk away from, the, really walk away from the 19th century thing, but not walk into the 20th century thing, which is this astringent, modernist, minimalist, stripped down, icy, intellectual, anti-physical philosophy. Um, you know, just really spare and arrogant and elite and just the worst way to try to talk to people. People want to be in, where's the Natural History Museum in London? Yeah, like little carved monkeys. I want carved monkeys and, and, and squid-shaped capitals and I want to be in a place that feels redolent with narrative, redolent with texture, redolent with associative functions, and then I'll look at the thing, right? But I think right now, it, it, there's almost, you know, there's that architecture-driven architects, man. You know, and it's just all this icy, metallic, thin, spare, bodiless, masculine, mechanical, bad. Um, bad. Human bodies navigate in organic space. They navigate by reference to texture. They navigate by reference to articulation. They navigate by reference to color and angle of light. And they navigate by reference to representational imagery. And that is in your body. In your body. You can't fight it. You're not going to change it. None of those early 20th century architectural theorists are right. Mies van der Rohe, Corbusier, they're wrong. You're not going to change the way people are by forcing them to live in white boxes. They're not going to change. They want to live in something with texture, with color, with reference, with poetry, with complicated articulation, and they will explore that place because it implies that exploration will be rewarded with discovery. That's what I have to say. Hello. Thank you very much, Mr. Joe Rohde, for that very inspiring and moving talk. I hope this pushes us to move backwards and or pushes, pushes us back to think on how we work in our science centers, in our museums, and how we work with our colleagues, our staff, and how we develop our exhibits and institutions, okay? So just a refresher before we proceed to the rest of day two. Um, can I ask you, what is our theme again? It's already written beside me. What is it? The whole thing first. What is it? An, an inspirational science camp. Camp. Reference on the camp, okay? So to set the camp mode again for day two, we have with us Mr. Joseph De La Cruz from Role Players. Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. I'm not sure if the, the lapel mic is working or not. Hello, good morning. Yeah, let's, let's do this. Hello. hello. When I say hello, you say? Hi. Again, hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, I'm here again. I'm Joseph Delacruz. I'm part of Role Players. And I'm here to bring you to that powerful, positive, emotional state again. When I was here very early a while ago, and there was this small conference there, and uh, I think the MC was trying to ask the participants why did they come here. And most of them were here to learn something new to experience something new. And when we acquire a new knowledge or a new skill, we have to practice it. When we have a new knowledge or a new skill, we want to achieve ma mastery first. We want to memorize it. We want to memorize it. And we want to achieve eventually ownership of this knowledge or this 
are listening to these talks, your mindset is, how can I apply this to our setting? How can I own this? And eventually, how can I contribute to this vast uh, a new knowledge? The other uh, term for this is to memorize, to achieve mastery, then to have ownership, and then to somehow go to creativity. But we cannot go immediately to creativity if we not yet master the things that are already existing. When uh, Joe, our speaker, uh, shared to us his experience, before he went to creativity, he studied uh, the, existing, the existing things. He studied patterns, the people, nature, and everything. And then when he understood it already, that's when creativity steps in. Same with theater. Same with theater. Uh, my group, Tarhara Ateneo, presented William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. And funny thing is, who wants to watch Shakespeare if it, it is staged already a thousand times? What can it offer? Some, uh, it, can, it, can it offer something new? We did Romeo and Juliet in a Philippine setting, and it's called This is called Sintang Danisar. Sintang Danisar. We found a text, an existing text, a Tagalog text, uh, written in the 1900s. And it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is entitled Sintang Danisar. Sintang Danisar roughly translated as pure love. And the Tagalog poet, the Tagalog poet narrates the story of Romeo and Juliet. So we stage it as Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, but in Philippine setting. Try to understand the text, Romeo and Juliet, then try to own it, try to put it in the Philippine setting, and try to contribute uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the knowledge in Shakespeare. We presented Zintang Delisa, and we were able to give it a Philippine flavor. And we set it up in Mindanao, and we acquired, uh, we, we, uh, we learned how to use Eagle. Eagle is an ethnic dance in. Uh, presented it. It's Romeo and Juliet, but with a new and creative flavor. How did we do it? Memorize, own, contribute, achieve mastery, ownership, then we make our own contribution, creativity, creativity. And I guess the knowledge and the skills that you will learn from this conference I think you will also try to own it and try to bring it back to your own setting to have your contribution. And I want you to experience the whole thing right, before we go to our uh, other talks. I want you to experience the whole thing, how to acquire mastery, how to acquire ownership, then eventually make our own contribution. Right? So how will we do this? We will do this through I think the oldest that we've taught is around 75 years old. And he was able to do this. So I think you will get a hang of it. Right? I will teach you eight sets of eight counts. Eight sets of eight counts. What's that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of those uh, counts. All right? So I'd like you to stand up. I will teach you. How to dance, and we will achieve mastery, ownership, then probably make a contribution or creativity, push ourselves to creativity right, at the end of this uh, session. Okay? So the first eight, first eight, first eight. Right hand first, right hand first. This is very easy. 
So side up, side up, and then I want you to swoop to the right, then swoop to the left. Okay, can I see? Can I see? I will try to mirror you. I will try to mirror you. So my your ha right hand is my left hand. Okay? So let's do the first eight. Okay? Side up, side up, swoop to the right, then swoop to the left. Oh, very good, very good. I have a good news. The second eight is just a repetition of the first eight. Okay, so we will try to repeat it. Okay? So side up, side up, swoop to the left, right? Swoop to the left. And then side up again, side up, swoop to the right.